year 1944. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. Some kind of wondrous insanity. The beaches of Normandy became the target for the invasion of Europe and the defeat of Nazi Germany. D-Day was fixed for early June 1944. It was here on the beach in Normandy that the first phase of the Allied campaign to liberate Europe could be won or lost. Everywhere you looked, as far as you could see, floating in the water were bodies. Along the south coast of Devon and Cornwall, Villagers and farmers were evacuated inland as invasion rehearsals intensified and the area was requisitioned for live action training. One such place was the tiny village of Slapton and its nearby beach. Bearing a similarity to Utah Beach, which the 29th Infantry were destined to attack, it was used many times as a practice area for the troops and sailors manning the landing vessels. The difficulties of operating a multi-tier inter-services and international operation became apparent in late April, just over a month from the projected start for D-Day. Exercise Tiger was assembling off the coast near Slapton in Devon. To give the troops a taste of what was to come, all vessels, trucks and tanks were fully gassed up and men loaded with full battle equipment. To add to the realism, on orders from Eisenhower, land-based artillery and machine guns were trained on the beach with live ammunition and the US and British battleship were to fire a preliminary bombardment 50 minutes before the landing craft hit the beach. Things started to go wrong from the beginning. On the first day, H hour and the bombardments were delayed by an hour to 8.30 a.m. The American and British forces involved had been given different radio frequencies for the exercise and told to keep strict radio silence unless there was an emergency. Neither side knew that the other was not in contact. The message did not reach all of the landing craft. Some drove onto the beach and offloaded their men just as the beach barrage began. Halfway to the beach, when we were straddled by uh, a salvo from the United States battleship Texas. Around 300 American soldiers and sailors were killed as the artillery and naval shells tore up the beaches. Later that day, as the main force assembled, one escort was accidentally rammed by an LST and could not carry on. Thinly protected by just one Royal Navy corvette, the fleet of eight LSTs formed up as night fell. German activity in the channel had increased as it became apparent that the Allies were preparing for an invasion somewhere on mainland Europe. As the ships made their way through the English Channel to their destination, soldiers on the tank deck began to fall asleep. Many of them, in full combat gear, were sitting in their vehicles or lying underneath them. Vehicles were parked bumper to bumper ammunition cases were full, the fuel tanks were full, sailors not at their assigned watches were asleep in their berths. This was to be a full dress rehearsal in the morning. A flotilla of S-boats was lurking undetected off the coast of England, looking for targets. In the middle of the night, they found them. In the darkness, the unseen S-boats crept closer and then raced into the attack unleashing salvos of deadly torpedoes. Many of these fortunately ran under the shallow drafted LSTs. But two vessels were hit and massive explosions rent the night air. The Schnell boats also fired their heavy machine guns at the LSTs. The gasoline on board igniting and the vehicles breaking their chains, crushing many soldiers and sailors General quarters woke me up. Where I went topside, I was the uh, first load on the 40 millimeter. A minute later, two torpedoes hit the 531, which was 
astern of us. One torpedo bounced off of our ship and another went underneath. The firing from 496 Lee boats wounded about 15 soldiers and sailors on our ship, including the captain. He was bleeding but wouldn't get off running the ship. He told him he was the captain and he would take care of everything. Men had no training about how to abandon ship and simply leapt overboard in full battle gear or took to the remaining life rafts. The fleet was ordered to scatter. Another stricken LST limped back to port with its stern blown clean off. Out in the darkness of the bay, hundreds of men, some of them injured, floundered in the cold channel waters or perished in the flames on board the blazing vessels. Most men had their life jackets tied around their waists, not across their chests, flipping them over and drowning them. Others succumbed to hypothermia. Over the next few days, around 700 American bodies were laid out on the beaches at Slapton and further along the coast. More than twice the number that were killed on their target beach of Utah. For months afterwards, bodies were washed up from the bay. Screens were erected along the beaches. Local rumours abounded about a secret grave on a farm, 10 miles inland, where many of the men were buried. The disaster was hushed up and veiled in secrecy for over 40 years. We talked about this, you'd be court martial but that's top secret. Fine, I know it stayed that way till the end of the war. We dropped off our casualties. We got word later that they went to the hospital and the doctors were ordered not to say anything to anybody because it would be a court-martial offence. Records show that after the war they were quietly disinterred and relocated to the US cemetery at Cambridge. For years afterwards the local fishermen had great problems with what they brought up in the nets. They were always complaining that their nets snagged on something at the bottom of the bay. A local guy took it upon himself in 1984 to go and find out what it was. Uh, 507 is in two halves, uh, about 200 metres apart from each other. 531 is intact but heavily broken in the centre. And he found the remains of a Sherman tank. After a lot of effort, time and money, the tank was brought up and made into a monument to the dead of that exercise and a monument to all of the people who were involved in Operation Tiger and the Normandy landings. Those not recovered at the time are also honoured here at Slapton and at Cambridge. And what at first glance appears to be just a blank wall in fact contains the names of over 5,000 American servicemen, those that are missing. Those that are recovered rest over there, over 4,000 of them. The poor communication between the Allies and the common responsibility structure was fatally flawed. Events like Exercise Tiger with the Americans and the earlier raid on Dieppe with the British and Canadians were costly and harsh reminders of the difficulties the Allies faced. But the lessons learned and put into practice for the invasion saved many lives on D-Day. These men did not die in vain. As the Armada began to assemble, aircraft attacked vital roads and bridges, virtually sealing off the landing area. Thousands of men bid farewell to their loved ones. Security became tight as a drum as the Allied might flexed and coiled, ready to cross the Channel to Normandy and strike the opening blow for the liberation of Europe. Beaches codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Sword and Juno were soon to become household names. The story of these times is fixed in many memories for the British, Canadian, Commonwealth and American troops, as well as the civilian population. It affected every single man, woman and child of all the major Commonwealth nations that were involved in it in a way that no other war ever has. As this was the 75th anniversary of a world-changing event, 
there was an increased interest from many different areas and angles. There are lots of little parties, memorial events going on around here. And they're starting to appreciate and remember what went on 75 years ago. There are many people who would assume that it was an entirely American operation, when in actual fact, if you're talking about dominant partners just for D-Day, it's probably Britain, because all three service chiefs are British, three quarters of the warships were British, three quarters of the landing craft were British, two thirds of the air forces were British, um, two thirds of the forces landed were British and Canadian. From August onwards, the Americans take the kind of sort of uh, the upper hand in terms of numerical superiority of their, over their allies, but not on D-Day. People and communities throughout Europe, Britain and the USA, and other parts of the world, suddenly seem to realize the enormity of the occasion, and also that this was a last chance to commemorate it before those originally involved passed away. Their personal recollections might be forever lost. <laughs> You know, 15 years time, there's going to be no one left who actually fought in the Second World War. We're trying to keep history alive and we work, you know, with various different groups and things because sometimes they came home from war and never want to talk about their stories. It's something that many have never done and they saw many horrors. So those questions were never asked and then sadly it was too late. Seeing the uniform they would have worn, what they would have been doing on the aircraft as well, it really brings them home. They can get up close, they can see it, they can talk to us um, and hopefully keep you know their family history alive. Any other questions? Everyone can Google everything now and find it out, but hopefully you remember it more by being able to touch it and see it and be up close to it. Good morning, we're the skirmish team and we're dedicated to the preserving the memory of the British soldier and on this occasion those that were involved in the D-Day landings. Of course there has to be enjoyment in this, but all those I've met over the years do this with a great respect for the people of a generation that endured so much and gave so much for the freedom we enjoy today. They had these, we're, gonna to, we're going to do this uh, kind of mindset and that really appeals to me. I like to keep my 1944 Willys Jeep up and running as my own personal contribution to this period of history. But my indulgence in this field is tiny compared to that of some others I know. Jim Clark of Allied Forces actually makes a living out of this hobby come obsession with history. Some of us might think, ah, oh, it's just a pile of junk. But to people like Jim, it's history. And they love restoring it to a working, operable, representative of what happened in Normandy. Jeeps, trucks, a prime mover tractor with a 90 mm gun, and of course, a Sherman tank. Absolutely lovely. It's a brand new engine, in a, I found it in a crate in uh, Utah. As time goes on, and the veterans pass away, Artifacts like this will be all that is left. It's people like Jim and others who spend their time, money, effort, and even their lifestyle working on these machines to bring them back as part of living history. There's some kind of wondrous insanity involved in this. To breathe life into what would have been a rusting piece of metal that would have just disappeared into the ground. And this is the sort of heavy engineering you have to be good at and patient enough to do to keep one of these things rolling and on the road. It's way above my pay grade, I can tell you. Driving Hitler's calling coffin, about the lads who drove them, how they trained in, um, in America. Which is um, Howard Mueller. He got his sleeping quarters when he came over on the Queen Mary and they went over D-Day plus one. Some went from Weymouth, Portsmouth, or all, all along those, the, the big ports along there. The 110th were the first anti-aircraft battalion to shoot down a German plane on French soil. And the pilot was captured, and he went back to England on the LST that they came over on. Jim and the lads are still working on the gun, and there's a debate whether it actually will happen for Normandy. Believe it or not, the French authorities were not too keen having a large 90mm gun that was live near various heads of state. So that's not going to happen, but it's going to be on the road soon. And sure enough, after a lot of hard work, late nights, fair dollop of cash, the gun, tractor and transport were ready to show. And we set off for Chalk Valley historical event in Wiltshire. The tank followed later in the day. And getting down those small, narrow English country lanes was not an easy job. 
So after eight or nine years of hard work, Jim has managed to get his gun and his tractor up and working and ready for show. And he's rather proud of it, rightfully so. Chalk Valley History Event, a place for serious reenactors. As you might see behind me, there is a mock-up of a typhoon. It's full of fantastic characters, interesting people, and meticulous research. Here is the launch point. You can see already the battleships have moored, and each battleship is firing at a gun in place. But we've got to find out what the plan is for today. And that meant talking to the ringmaster of this event, a certain James Holland. For some people, mainly too young to remember the war years, they recreate as best they can the spirit of the times. And for many of these, it is an all-consuming and expensive passion. James Holland had also organised a representative display of the type of the action that British and American troops would have faced as they fought their way through Normandy. With a Machiavellian twist, James had organised for the troops to be kitted out with the weapons and uniforms from the Normandy period. But these were not ordinary guys. They were serving members of the British Army, the Royal Anglian Rifles, just back from a tour of Afghanistan. This is what living history is all about. Getting in with it. I've got the required black beret to be a commander in a tank. It's the Royal Scots Guards and uh, God, my family would kill me. With multiple coughs and bangs, we formed up ready to go. Okay, we're warming up. Jim's giving it hell. Accompanied by another Sherman, we were to provide the armoured support as the troops tackled two German MG42 machine gun posts. Everyone accepts that the conditions and the realism was far away from the actual event, but there was enough going on to give the audience an idea of how soldiers of that era operated. And this is how most tank commanders would have ridden, their head out of the turret, and it's a very, very dangerous place to be, because everybody in the world who's not on your side can see you and shoot your head off. The tank team performed some start-up manoeuvres to get the tanks in line, because these things weigh about 30 tonnes, and your field of vision is very, very small. The infantry worked out their tactics, where they were going to go, what they were going to do, and how they were going to do this, and the crowd waited patiently for the action to begin. Oh, it's going quiet. I can stop shouting now, can't I? As much as I love my time inside tanks, it is one of the most uncomfortable experiences, especially when you're over six foot and you're nowhere near as thin as you used to be, or as agile. Every time you move around, you bang something, you bump something, and that's when it's sort of more or less standing still. But how you'd get five guys in here, uh, gunner, loader, commander, driver, and bow gunner, that's absolutely amazing. One on one, Sherman against German tank, not always effective. There is some kind of sense of security at first, but when you realize how thin these walls actually are, and an armor piercing round would go through this like a knife through butter, right through the side of the tank. When that came through into this compartment, a shell would go into a tank and start ricocheting in the tank and just tear up the people that were in the, in the tank. And then we had to take them out and put them in boxes. Basically, anybody in his path was dead. And then we had the command. Driver, advance. The rapid firing German machine gun opened upon us. The infantry replied with their Lee Enfields and Brennan. Typical fire and maneuver operation. When you can see the enemy location, both tanks let loose with their main 75mm weapon. The advance continues. Machine gun posts were overrun. 
The operation completed and we returned to base. The lads seemed very pleased with things too. Well, that was something else. In the cold light of day the next morning, with a few sore heads, it was up to the team to disassemble the gun. The guys who did this originally were young, fit, well rehearsed and experts in what they did. We were none of that. But when you consider that all we had was a brief glimpse of a 1940s manual and no practice, it wasn't quite so bad, really. And considering the weight and the awkwardness of this machine, we realised how hard these guys actually had to work to make this happen. We did a pretty good job and nobody fell out with anybody too much. Even truck driver Kim was starting to be quite useful sometimes, despite his size. I resent that statement. Quickly became chefs, chiefs, three, Indians, one, cooks, two, broke three. too many spoils. Oh, Bugger, it just doesn't fit. Can't put that in there. No, not making any difference whatsoever. After all this poetry in motion, we eventually got the machine and the gun hooked up and driven away, just as it would have been in 1944. Only it took us a hell of a lot longer with a lot more bruises and scrapes. So the first US anti-aircraft gun to shoot down an enemy plane in northern France slowly made its way back up to its transport. Jim was a happy bunny. So in glorious sunshine, we left Chalk Valley historical event. A fantastic weekend, really, really can recommend this. Now we have to get Hitler's crawling coffin onto the low loader. Now that's approximately 40 feet and weighs 23 and a half tons. But we need careful hands and some steady nerves. Kit and Jamie work their magic with the chains and fasteners and the tractor and gun are safe and secure on the back of the truck. And that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is what can be described as an excellent weekend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's damn good living history. But the adventure did not stop there. On the way back home, we had a call from another James, owner of the landing craft. Would we like to film them at the show, just down the road in Portsmouth? How could we refuse? And in our Herculean efforts to get this very disparate group of people filmed, we've just hit 2,000 miles over the last week. When we got there, the crew was still getting the craft ready and painted. Last time I saw James, he was up in Bristol with this, slightly nervous about putting it in the water and even more nervous about it floating. The engine works fine, they just haven't put the boat, engine and water together. This is one of the few remaining serviceable landing craft of this type in the world. I'll just get a bigger rammer. <laughs> this was a star in Private Ryan. The main scene, that's that boat. <laughs> just to add to the situation, we'll get the 3.7 gun out yet. Yeah, we'll get sort this gun out. We're just going to take the gun from the uh, to the event. James's team, the Dig for Victory boys, had also brought their gun and were towing it with the slow moving AEC Matador. With a top speed of around 20 miles an hour, it was a traffic nightmare. When James had finally managed to release the hamdrum, it's the newness. We set off to the showground, driving an 80-year-old vehicle with no power steering, no power brakes, a non-synchro gearbox, requires a lot of skill, especially with a big gun on the back, and in today's traffic. That's 15 miles an hour. These trucks are well known for not going fast, and stopping even slower. The plan was to set up the gun and other exhibits overnight on this historic piece of ground and do a beach landing with the boat the next day. This watertight area near Portsmouth was one of the main British, Canadian and American embarkation points. The soldiers and vehicles assembled here were driven straight into the mouths of the LST. They went straight across to Normandy. Team Shopland brought their gun into position, elevated it to the correct position 
and let the crowd know what the sound of just one of these guns was like. 75 years ago, there were hundreds of these in the area to protect the invasion fleet. With her paintwork still wet and everything on board untried or tested, the landing craft rendezvoused with restored gunboats and launches from this era and made her way from the historic Portsmouth Harbour to the embarkation beach, where an expectant crowd was gathering. Despite it being the first time, James and crew confidently steered into the shore, dropped the ramp and landed a couple of Tommies on the beach. It was an emotional moment. I was signal aboard, up the ramp, and into one of the most iconic images of the D-Day period. Everyone in the team had practiced their roles on dry land, and we did have some expert Royal Navy help on board, but this was the first time at sea. After a while, our coxswain got used to her. The team swung into action, and we patrolled up and down the shore. We, uh, we're pretty chuffed that we managed to get out here. Get it on the water. I mean, truthful, it's, it's the guys around you, the guys you see here on the boat. They've, they've worked their socks off to make this happen. I just got in the way, really. Courtesy of American Express, MasterCard, and Visa, there's a boat here today. Don't tell my wife that, by the way. It was a warm, sunny day in calm seas, and no one was shooting or shelling us. How different it would have been 75 years ago. So far, charting our course of the 75th anniversary of D-Day, tanks, guns, men and trucks have provided the land-based historical references. James and his landing craft, the seaborne elements. But what about the airborne aspects? Right on cue, we were treated to an aerial reminder of a rendezvous we have to keep in France with some exceptional guys we had met earlier in Florida. They were going to extraordinary lengths to recreate something very special. And one aircraft that epitomized the airborne side of the Normandy invasion was the C-47, the Dakota. These guys are going to fly these 75-year-old aircraft, about 20 of them, across the Atlantic, from America, via Newfoundland, Iceland, to the UK, and partake in the 75th D-Day commemorations in Normandy. One of the aircraft has a very special place. That's all brother. She was the lead plane in the lead section of American paratroopers heading to the drop zones near the coast in Normandy. And we are going to be with them. 75 years to the day. <laughs> 